We'll start in 2008, which was, I think, all around a pretty disastrous year for global financial markets. The global financial crisis saw the Dow Jones drop about 50% in a number of months, and millions of people lose their life savings, lose their homes. And it was on that backdrop of dissatisfaction with the financial incumbents that the cryptocurrency revolution was born. So in October 2008, this mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto, be he man, woman, group of people, uh, published a white paper entitled Bitcoin, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer electronic cash system. And it was published to an open source tech forum that anyone could see. And that was the first the world had ever heard of Bitcoin, of cryptocurrencies in that way. Now, digital currencies had existed for a very long time in various different shapes and forms. But they'd always been hampered by these seemingly key, insurmountable problems that prevented them from scaling, that prevented them from going mainstream. And Satoshi tied a few intrinsic concepts together, sort of putting them all together into a package that was quite poetic, I guess, in the way it came about, and fueled a, a revolution, I guess, started a revolution that we see now today, the cryptocurrency revolution now. The market sits at about $200 billion. Um, we've got over 1,800 different cryptocurrencies, and yes, market sentiment at the current moment isn't that positive, but we're still considering an industry that looks set to sort of rock the core of the global financial markets um, for the future. So what were some of these concepts that were tied together? We'll start with blockchain technology, which has become a bit of an overhyped buzzword recently, unfortunately, um, and the concept of distributed ledgers. With blockchain technology, essentially, every transaction that is broadcast to a network is grouped into a selection of blocks, um, a group of the most recent transactions. And these are then filed away on a chain, um, on a chain of these blocks, of the blocks preceding and the blocks leading on from one another. To give you an example, let's say Jill paid Jim one Bitcoin. Now, that, that transaction would be recorded on the blockchain. When that same Bitcoin was paid by Jim on to John, that would then be recorded on the blockchain as the next link in the chain, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And this is a chain which is then recorded on this ledger, which we call a distributed ledger. And it's called a distributed ledger because unlike a traditional record, which is stored in a central point, a distributed ledger is distributed across the capacity of the entire network, in this case, the internet. Now, this has two important outcomes. The first is that there's no central point of control. And without a central point of control, there's no central point of failure which means that it is impossible to shut this down without shutting down the entire network. Which is why when people ask me, I was like, well, why don't they just shut down Bitcoin? Well, it's like, yeah, you can, but you have to shut down the internet, which is a sufficient hurdle. The second part of this whole, um, well, the second outcome, I guess, is the fact that being a distributed ledger, there's full transparency um, on every transaction that is recorded on the network. Um, it is openly visible to absolutely anyone who, who wants to view it. Now, this is fundamentally different from the way financial systems have worked for the most part, where there's no publicly available record of transactions, and we have this implicit trust that we have to have, I guess, in banks and governments and regulatory bodies to act in our best interests um, and to act in an ethical and, and moral way. And we all know how that has turned out for us in the past and probably looks likely to again in the near future. So that's one concept. The other key concept that we have to talk about is decentralization. Now, very simply put, decentralization is the idea of the locus of control or power being taken away from a centralized authority and being returned to the using populace. As a concept, it's something that's already seeped into our daily lives without us maybe perhaps considering it as so. Consider Uber, the transportation provider that has no cars or Airbnb, the accommodation provider that owns no houses, or Airtasker, the um, manpower provider that doesn't have a workforce. These are things we've sort of just accepted. Um, but when the same thing is translated to money, the idea of not having a third party seems to be something that society finds much harder to swallow. Principally, I guess, because inherently humans seem unable to trust each other, or the fact that we've repeatedly demonstrated that we cannot be trusted. And in no area, I guess, is trust more necessary than when it comes to money, to finance, to payment systems, to stores of value. 
And so these third parties that established the tr this, this, this trust, the banks, for example, have been assigned a level of importance um, that is so great that they've been considered almost above question, or as the financial crisis demonstrated, too big to fail, if anyone remembers that word, or even in the face of failure, to be deserving of financial reward. Um, it's all pretty ridiculous. Now, with cryptocurrencies, um, they're decentralized economies. There's no need for a central party to verify particular transactions. There's no need for a regulatory body to remain, maintain oversight that these transactions are verified and authenticated. Um, and there's no need for, anyone to for any single third party to establish that a particular sum of value belongs to a particular person. And the reason why that is so, and it's all a little bit abstract that I'm trying to condense into a couple of minutes, the reason why this is so is that they work on a, on a paradigm known as a consensus protocol. And broadly speaking, the way a consensus protocol works is that when a particular transaction occurs, this transaction is then broadcast onto the network. At this point, anyone in the network in exchange for a small financial reward or a transaction fee, anyone in the network can attempt to solve a series of complex cryptographic riddles. Yeah? Yeah. Um, a series of complex cryptographic riddles that require considerable computational power um, so as to verify that this transaction is accurate. And this could be a predetermined number of verifications. Could be six, could be 100, depending on what that particular transaction requires. And when that particular number of verifications have been reached, aka consensus has been reached, that transaction is then recorded uh, in def well, definitively on, uh, on the network, on the blockchain, on the distributed ledger. And it is now a record that cannot be erased um, and that is forever linked on this chain till, well, till the end of time, whatever that may be conceptually. So decentralization marks a pretty critical paradigm shift from having a centralized point where all the authority is vested in to a situation where the authority is returned to the using populace and the centralized institutions instead act purely as facilitators, like in the case of Airbnb or in the case of Uber. So we have blockchain technology, distributed ledgers, decentralization, pretty key concepts that Satoshi kind of brought together. Now, the third concept I'd like to introduce is the idea of tokenization and smart contracts. Now, tokenization at its core is a pretty simple construct. It's the idea of breaking down a whole into much smaller parts um, with, well, with a, a token um, representing the, I guess, the share of value of each of those parts. The uh, easiest way or the most common way that we understand this is perhaps shares in a company. However, in the cryptocurrency world, this takes on a whole dimension of potential, added dimension of potential, with the addition of smart contracts. Now, smart contracts, how many buzzwords have I now thrown at you in about five minutes? <laughs> smart contracts. Smart contracts are essentially electronic contracts that have written into their cryptographic code the capacity to execute themselves if a certain set of rules are followed or if a certain set of outcomes are reached. I'll give you an example. Let's say a friend makes a bet with you um, that a certain president will, reach, will have a second term in office. And things are going well until um, close to the, about three months before the end of his presidency, there is some major scandal. Um, not a surprise in certain countries that we know of or in our very own country at the moment. Um, and there's this big scandal and there's a huge loss of approval ratings for this particular president. His party turns against him and your friend decides, nah, -uh, I'm not having this anymore, and he pulls out of the bet. Now, if this had all been written to a smart contract when you had made this agreement, and each of your individual bets had been tied into the smart contract with a code written such that the, the, well, the contract would execute on the day that the results came out. There would be no way for him to pull out of the contract. There would be no need for third-party mediation. There would be no need for sort of external oversight. And this would proceed on um, just as it was meant to be. Now, it seems like a pretty petty example, but consider that on a much grander scale. Consider that in the case of multi-million dollar contracts, where vast sums of money are paid out for legal fees, for bank fees, for escrow fees, for paperwork. All these different things that we have put in place just to ensure that people do what they're supposed to do. And when you consider all of that, 
that would be rendered obsolete, all these other service providers that would be rendered obsolete by this technology. Perhaps you also get an idea of exactly where some of the noise of opposition towards this movement um, stems from. Right, so buzzword, 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 buzzword. I'm going to attempt to tie all of these together in one, <laughs> one sort of use case scenario that demonstrates perhaps what a world of the future may look like um, with all these concepts tied in. I'm going to use an example that fortunately or unfortunately, none of us are ever able to escape from, uh, taxes. Now, I don't personally have a problem with paying taxes. I don't have a problem with paying taxes that go towards healthcare, welfare, education, public transport, public education, things that improve my environment or that improve the people around me. What I do have a problem with is the defense budget. What I do have a problem with is my taxes going to a new fleet of fighter planes so that my politicians can you know, wag their metaphorical phalluses at each other. That I have a problem with. So what, I guess the, the true tenet of democracy is that you elect people into government and that they act in your best interests, or rather that they act towards the outcomes that they promise you that they would act in. We know that doesn't really happen in reality. So what if we use the incentivizing factor of money, or in this case, taxes? Imagine a world where your taxes, perhaps, could be split, could be parceled out into individual parcels that were destined to particular categories that you wanted to, them to be used to, or, again, conversely, that your politicians promised you that they would be used for. These individual parcels could be written up into smart contracts, there you go, and these smart contracts would then be broadcast into the network where they would be verified and they would then be head on towards parliament. When they get there, they would then execute if the parliamentarians did then push them aside to push them into the particular categories in which they were destined to do. Um, this whole process, being on the blockchain, would be completely transparent and you could remain, maintain visibility from start to finish of exactly where your taxes were going to, where all your money was going to. And your parliamentarians, I guess, your politicians, could be paid off from a little sliver of this if they did execute those contracts in the way that they've been promised to do and not otherwise. Uh, I recognize that this is a pretty romantic image that I am painting, and there's always, with every utopian ideal, there's quite a distinct dystopian shadow. Um, and it's still a very young industry and a lot of kinks to be ironed out, but it's perhaps a world that we can approximate to with the use of this technology. It's the kind of world that Satoshi imagined, where transparency, democracy, liberty, um, were all publicly available and returned to the using populace. And it's this revolution of which cryptocurrencies are perhaps the most visible manifestation as we know it, um, which is powered by technology and philosophy, sort of in equal measure, um, which, which is the world we're heading towards. And I find that whole concept um, a highly poetic notion. And I guess I want my world of the future um, to be the kind of world that the poets would write about. So thank you.